What is up? Good mic work. Back at you with what I hope will be a relatively short video this week. I'm just going to touch on a couple of things. We'll briefly go through Raw, and I'll touch on all the WWE releases that we saw happen this past week. And we'll probably have some Extreme Rules discussion as well. Uh, first of all, I just want to apologize for the delay on the Q&A. I know I've been advertising a Q&A segment, and I'm just about done with it. I've been working on it. I'm putting a little bit more time into it and answering a few more questions than usual since I haven't given you a Q&A uh, in about six months since my end-of-the-year video. But not only that, I've had an extremely busy week. As a matter of fact, I pretty much detach myself from anything good mic work related for the last seven days. Occasionally saying a thing or two on Twitter, but otherwise I haven't been doing much with the channel, nor have I been working on any commentaries or Q&A. Two reasons. Number one, my father was in town visiting, uh, but despite that, I still thought I would have time to work on the Q&A, but then I fell ill. I got really under the weather this past week. I never get sick like that. It's a very rare thing for me to catch a cold or have the flu or anything like that. I never have any more than the sniffles. I swear I haven't been seriously sick in probably 10 years, but felt like complete ass all last week and really just wasn't up to doing any commentaries. But I'm back to normal now. I'll finish up that Q&A and have it to you in just a few days. So we'll start with Raw while this fighter jet flies over my house. Hopefully you guys cannot hear that through the microphone. But uh, tonight was different. It had a different type of feel to it and a really interesting opening. With Chris Jericho having his highlight reel to kick off the show, his guest was supposed to be Dean Ambrose, but of course Dean is at home selling the injury from Mitch being smashed upon his head. Jericho runs him down a little bit, talks about how he put him in the hospital, shows all the funny-ass tweets on the Jeritron 5000 from last week when we were all freaking out about Mitch and trying to put him in the Hall of Fame and making tribute videos to him. But then he gets interrupted by Cass, of all people, which was interesting. He comes out there, he's all by himself. Enzo, of course, is still at home after that concussion and that big scare that he had at Payback. He comes out there and gets in the ring with Jericho and starts cutting a promo on him and holds his own. He really holds his own on the mic with Chris Jericho. I was really impressed with Cass. I loved it. Fans seem to be behind him, too. He's big, he's good-looking, and I think he can work a little bit. And I'm excited for the potential of a guy like this. I don't know what's going to happen when Enzo comes back. I'm assuming they will go back to being in their tag team. But Enzo, at this point, if Cass ends up getting over, he could be better suited as a manager. But that's looking way ahead. Tonight was almost Cass's coming-out party. Opens the show instead of a boring-ass authority promo or any of the other dumb shit that we've been getting for months and months and months. They started off with Chris Jericho working with a young guy, a guy that just got there four or five weeks ago, so I found that very pleasing. Things do eventually turn physical, and Cass actually kicks the crap out of Chris Jericho, pissing him off. He's crying like a baby. What winds up happening later on is he goes backstage to talk to Stephanie, and she says, hey, I'll tell you what, Jericho, how about you take on Cass in the main event? The main event. This kid is actually going to be in the main event of Monday Night Raw, so I found that very surprising and uh, a nice breath of fresh air. We'll get to that main event here in just a little bit. Next up, we had a match that I thought would be taking place at Extreme Rules, but I guess not. Baron Corbin beat Dolph Ziggler relatively convincingly also. So I don't know if there's even room to do another match at this point. It looks like they're done. So Corbin keeps on rolling, and uh, he's pretty impressive also. I even tweeted out during this match as a legitimate question because I had no idea. I was wondering if Big Cass and Baron Corbin had ever crossed paths in NXT and had a one-on-one -on -one match. And a lot of you responded that they never worked together, and that really surprised me. It surprised me because I thought WWE would at least maybe want to put them together at least once. Because if they ever become big stars, they might want to look back on their developmental footage. You know, kind of reminds me of when they show Brock Lesnar versus Randy Orton or Brock Lesnar versus John Cena in OVW. Uh, you would think even though they don't have much to do with each other, Cass was in a tag team and Corbin was being smashed over as a single star, they still should have maybe worked a match together at least once. I think it would be a pretty sweet-ass battle. We go to a backstage segment next with Shane McMahon, Ric Flair, and Charlotte. Shane is telling Ric Flair that in Charlotte's match tonight against Paige, he is not allowed at ringside. And I believe the stipulation is that he's not allowed at ringside during the Extreme Rules submission match either. They cut to another backstage segment next with AJ Styles, who seems fine after that uh, beatdown that he suffered last week. I seem to remember a certain other WWE superstar that fans would crucify if he showed up and did anything after a severe beatdown, but I'm not mentioning any names, <clears throat> John Cena. But AJ and his buddies are back together. They're going to be taking on Roman Reigns and the Usos in a six-man elimination match on the show tonight. So they were basically uh, hyping up that, and AJ was talking about Roman Reigns and the beatdown that he got. My stream was acting like an asshole during this segment, so I didn't quite hear what AJ said, but I seriously doubt it was anything uh, groundbreaking, just furthering the storyline. 
And then all the choppiness on my video seems to stop right around the time that Fandango is taking on our truth Tyler Breeze and Goldust are out there, and Goldust and Fandango apparently are calling themselves Goldango. That sounds like something gross and sexual. I can't quite put my finger on it. Or in it. And to tell you the complete honest truth, I'm looking at my notes here, and I don't even have written down who won that match because I wasn't paying attention. But you know what? Who cares? After that, we go backstage again, I believe, and all three men involved in the Triple Threat Intercontinental title match at Extreme Rules are back there with Shane and Stephanie, and uh, they're talking about the three-way match or whatever the fuck, and then Sami Zayn interrupts and says, hey, I want a chance to get in this match. Everybody saw me last week. I picked up the Intercontinental title. The fans started cheering. How about we have a match between me and The Miz? If I beat him, I'm in this match as well, and it becomes a fatal four-way. Stephanie and Shane, oddly enough, do agree on it. They've been agreeing on a lot of things lately, and I'll talk about that in a minute. They say, all right, no problem, you're on, and that's that. Now, as far as Stephanie goes... You know, she's really being nice to Shane. I mean, if this was the Attitude Era, I swear they would be setting up something sexual between these two because she is being extremely nice to Shane and I'm just waiting for the two of them to kiss or fuck or something. But luckily in today's era, we're not going to see that. Although, you have to wonder why Stephanie is being so cooperative. So, if you ask me, she's too vindictive, she's too much of a conniving bitch to actually be this sincere, so you know she's got to be setting Shane up. She's going to pretend to play the game for a while, lure him into that false sense of security, and then and bam, he gets attacked by Triple H, or something like that. And even the end of the show, remember how Raw basically went off the air with Shane and Stephanie in the backstage area, and they kind of part ways and you know for the night, and they say, good job, and we actually coexisted, and this might actually work out. Shane walks away, and then Stephanie is sitting there staring, looking at that picture of, I think Shane, or I think her and her dad. Or maybe it's Shane, I don't even know, which one is it? But uh, she looks at that family picture there and she kind of has that look on her face and you know she's just, you know, she's got something up her sleeve. I truly don't think what we're seeing from Stephanie is a face turn. I mean, she's a heel through and through. We get Charlotte versus Paige up next. Natalia is doing commentary during this match and this was a great match. Uh, Ric Flair ends up getting involved. He can't help himself even though Shane has banned him from ringside. He comes out there anyway when Charlotte's in trouble. Shane McMahon's music hits, he comes out, and he has like 10 referees with him that come out there and escort Ric Flair out of the ring, allowing Paige to catch Charlotte off balance and scores the win over her. And Charlotte, you know, I love her. I mean, she is a great heel. I think uh, she should be a heel for a long time. I would like to see her be the female version of Ric Flair. Eventually, when Ric Flair leaves her side and she is on her own, which I think uh, she's ready for. I mean, I like having Flair associated with her because of what a legend and an icon that he is, uh, but he worries me a little bit. I mean, Ric Flair is getting older. He's a little bit crazy. His health is a concern. He's had a few episodes lately. I swear this guy's like two years away from falling and breaking his hip in a grocery store or something. I think at some point Charlotte should be left to fly on her own, and when she does, she's going to be really good. I mean, she's coming out there with the music and the robes, and I hope she does that her whole career and when she was sitting there sulking and crying after she lost that match it was great shit you know and she's great at being a bitch she's good on the mic i want to fucking choke her sometimes even though she's just doing her job extremely well and she's got a big future it was nice to see Paige actually get a victory tonight i sometimes forget about Paige and how good she is and that she's actually on the roster so her scoring a pin over charlotte is definitely going to help her stock a little bit hopefully As predicted, Sami Zayn did defeat The Miz in a pretty good match. Uh, Sami Zayn pretty much beat him clean, and now he is in that match. It will be a fatal four-way for the Intercontinental title. Um, I got to thinking about something during that, too, because it just uh, bothers me sort of how many three-ways and four-ways they have to have. And I tweeted out something to the effect that wouldn't you think it would be a good idea for them to have like a kayfabe rule where a champion during his title reign, whoever the champion is, WWE champion, IC, US tag, whatever, that title reign or that champion can only work or only defend the title a certain number of times in a multi-man match. So if they made a kayfabe rule that during any given title reign, you can only work a total of three multi-man matches, whether it be on Raw or whether it be on pay-per-view, title matches, that is, not just regular matches. It has to be for the title. But all other matches have to be one-on-one. If they did that... They could still have plenty of three and four ways, but at the same time, it might force the creative team to be a little bit more creative from time to time because
because they rely very heavily on these three ways and four ways for title belts instead of developing real, you know, old school feuds, you know, for the title, which is, I think, what Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens could wind up doing if they can ever get to a point where it's one on one for the IC title. Hopefully it will be after Extreme Rules. But I think in general, you know, if they had some sort of weird ass rule in place in some bullshit WWE handbook or something, kind of like how they say the champion is supposed to defend the title every 30 days, but it's not something they really enforce. You know, some sort of a rule like that, where the champion doesn't have to be put at a disadvantage more than a certain number of times, I think would not be a bad idea. Backstage we go again to a rumor that was confirmed. I saw some rumors and some tweets about the fact that Dana Brooke was backstage at Monday Night Raw. I don't even know much about her. I mean, I've seen her work a couple of times in NXT, but uh, didn't even realize that she was roster ready, to be honest with you. So a lot of people were speculating that she would debut on the show. They cut to a backstage segment with Becky where she's talking about what happened to her last week in her match with Emma. She's suffering from that eye injury that she had, I think, at WrestleMania, and Emma thumbed her last week right in the eye and scored the victory. And Emma approaches her and says, you know, you got to watch your back, and then Dana Brooke attacks her from behind. So it looks like we have an alliance between Dana Brooke and Emma. Emma yelled out some initials of what their silly-ass alliance is going to be called. I didn't even really hear what she said. But it looks like the two of these ladies have formed a pact, and uh, knowing the women's division, it shouldn't be long before they break up. But welcome to the main roster, Dana Brooke. I will have to get a little bit more familiar with you now that you're here, so I'll uh, hop on the network and watch some of your shit in NXT. Next up, we have Rusev taking on Sin Cara. Kalisto, of course, is at ringside. The two of those guys will face for the United States title at Extreme Rules. So this is just a little warm-up for Rusev against Kalisto's tag team partner. And Sin Cara gets the victory when Kalisto interfered. Kicked Rusev in the head, allowing Sin Cara to roll him up for a very long count. That I didn't like. I mean, Rusev is a lot bigger and a lot stronger than Sin Cara. The referee was way out of position, and he had him pinned for a full two seconds before the referee even got over there. So he rolled him up for what was essentially a five count. Not good. Rusev could have launched Sin Cara completely outside of the ring in that amount of time. So I didn't like really the finish, but it was pretty funny to see Rusev all pissed off and Lana, of course. And you got to wonder if he might actually take that belt off of Kalisto, especially since Sin Cara got the victory over him tonight. We got another Primo and Epico vignette. It's finally time for these guys to debut, I believe, next week. Uh, the Shining Stars, I believe they're called. Uh, they're going to be debuting next week, so we'll see how they look. This is their third uh, repackage, basically. So uh, we've seen them do a lot of things, and uh, I really wish those Carlito rumors were true. I would love to see him come back and be affiliated with these guys or manage these guys or something like that or form a three-man unit with him because we have a lot of three-man units right now. Don't know what his status is, but that would be cool if they eventually brought him in. But we got a new tag team on the way. These guys are good workers, but uh, they've had some goofy-ass gimmicks, so we will see what happens next week when they debut. We get that six-man elimination matchup next. The club, as they're calling them, Gallows, Anderson, and AJ Styles taking on Roman Reigns and the Usos. Of course, it comes down to Roman Reigns and AJ Styles, and I liked it. I like the ending here. I like what they're doing, setting up this match at Extreme Rules. Gallows and Anderson, after they get eliminated, reemerge. They attack Roman Reigns over the barricade. The match gets thrown out. I believe Roman Reigns wins by disqualification, I think. The Usos come out there while they're attacking Roman Reigns and fight them off. I believe they all brawl out into the crowd or into the backstage area or something, leaving Roman Reigns and AJ alone. AJ is the one that gets pissed this week. He starts tearing apart the announce table like he's going to do something on it, and Roman Reigns just picks him up and throws him right across. He lands sideways in the in the chair, which was crazy. They end up doing the thing in the ring where they've got the steel chair, and both of them are basically offering it up to the other one. You know, Roman Reigns picked up the chair and just gave it right to AJ. He's standing on the outside of the ring in phenomenal forearm position, and Roman Reigns just hands him the chair, and, and uh, AJ puts it down and kicks it right back over to him, so they're playing a little game. Finally, AJ goes for what we think is the phenomenal forearm, but dives completely over Roman Reigns all the way to the outside of the ring and goes up the ramp, and it was just a nice, you know, intense stare down, not too much physicality. It didn't get as violent as it did last week. You can start to see these guys figure out who the other one is and shit, so I thought it was well done, and I was okay with it. And so far, I've liked everything I've seen. You know, from AJ Styles. I saw a lot of tweets about, oh, Gallows and Anderson are there just to make Roman Reigns look strong. Well, he's the champion. You know, that's what you do with champions, especially a big champion like that. I'm just really sick and tired of people thinking that if you lose to the WWE champion, you're some sort of a fucking loser. These guys just got to the WWE three fucking weeks ago, and they've already had a couple of huge matches on Monday Night Raw with the WWE champion. What do you want these guys to do? Would you rather see them in the tag team division, feuding with New Day and being in silly-ass segments? No, they're in a very serious segment on top involving the WWE World Heavyweight title. 
That is not a bad position to be in, whether or not you win or fucking lose. It's ridiculous. Do you honestly think these guys would even come to the WWE if they were better off in Japan? They're being paid well, and they're being featured, and they're getting a ton of exposure. They are doing just fine. The next matchup was a weird one, but one that I liked. Kevin Owens defeated Zack Ryder. The reason they had this match is because earlier on backstage, Kevin Owens, I think, was bitching to Shane McMahon about the fact that he's giving guys, undeserving guys, opportunities at titles. And he's pissed off that Sami Zayn is now in the IC match, and it's a four-way. So building off that tension between the two, because I think these two have great chemistry on TV, and I would not be opposed to a feud between the two of them, uh, Shane says, all right, Kevin, whatever. How about this? You're going to go out there tonight and face Zack Ryder. If you lose to Zack Ryder, he takes your place, and you lose your Intercontinental title shot at Extreme Rules. So these guys are developing a really fun, off-to-the-side rivalry, and I like what I see between Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon. Luckily, Kevin Owens doesn't have any trouble whatsoever uh, defeating Zack Ryder and he cements his place in that fatal four-way match for the IC belt. We get New Day versus the Dudley Boys next. New Day, of course, comes out and cuts one of their promos. Good stuff. They're hyping up their match with the Vaude Villains at Extreme Rules for the tag team titles. The Dudley Boys actually score the victory over the New Day tonight. Devon hits Kofi with a sweet-ass clothesline and gets the pin. The Vaude Villains get involved. They attack. Uh, they even attack the New Day after the match. Left them all beaten up in the ring, especially Kofi, you know, adding fuel to the fire for their tag match in a couple weeks. Before we get to that main event, I don't think I mentioned the Darren Young segment. We heard rumors of this, that they were going to be repackaging Darren Young, basically doing a spoof on the election and Donald Trump. Darren Young has apparently recruited Bob Backlund, of all people. I mean, this guy is insane, and he's going to be Darren's life coach with the slogan, Make Darren Great Again. So I don't know how long it's going to take him to debut or if it's just going to be a promo thing. And we're going to see vignettes every week. I don't know if Darren's actually going to be wrestling matches and Bob Backlund's going to be in his corner. I don't even I don't even know if they can trust Bob Backlund on live TV. So I think this thing is a little goofy. For some reason, it just uh, it gives that Kerwin White type of feel. I don't know how to describe it, but not something I'm looking forward to. Vince McMahon, of course, is good friends with Donald Trump. This imbecile is actually a step away from the White House, which is completely insane when you think about it, but it's pretty natural for the WWE to want to capitalize on this, and that's fine, and who cares? I don't think this Darren Young character is really something to take that seriously, but it'll be interesting to see uh, what they do in the future. Now, unfortunately, as excited as I was about the main event, uh, it didn't happen. I really thought we would get a Cass versus Jericho main event, and Cass would get the victory, possibly with an assist from Dean Ambrose, who Jericho claims is not there. We knew that was horseshit. We knew before the night was over we were probably going to see Dean Ambrose. So I thought all night what would happen is they would go out there and have a small little match. Jericho would make Cass look strong. That apparently would be okay with the fans. And then Dean Ambrose would eventually show up and help Cass win somehow. That's what I thought that they were going to do. But we never got the match at all. Chris Jericho comes out for his entrance and Dean Ambrose attacks him on the ramp and then puts on the jacket and starts coming down to the ring like Chris Jericho and then the lights come on and you see it's Dean Ambrose wearing the jacket. This is his revenge for Jericho murdering Mitch last week, and he takes that lit-up jacket that Jericho reminded us about a million times that it cost $15,000. He takes off the jacket, and he begins destroying it. Jericho eventually does make his way down to the ring. He's pissed off. He runs into Cass, who does beat him up a little bit, and toss him around outside of the ring. But basically, he was just feeding him to Dean Ambrose, who just completely destroyed the jacket, ripped it to shreds, and threw it over Chris Jericho's body. And then as he's leaving, Jericho's trying to put it on and, and put it back together and everything. So all in all, it was pretty funny, but I was kind of disappointed in the ending segment. The crowd was quiet. You know, Dean Ambrose is a guy that's supposed to be over. You know, they weren't going nuts for him tearing up the jacket. You would think that they would. I mean, the fans were devastated last week after Mitch was killed. Wouldn't you think we would all get off on seeing something like this? So I wish the crowd reaction could have been better. But, you know, overall, it was just kind of a dud of a segment and a dud of a main event. And I wished we would have gotten some sort of a match between Chris Jericho and Cass. I don't care if they built to Jericho and Ambrose. I don't care if Ambrose closed out the show or did any of that jacket stuff. That would have been fine. I just wish Cass would have had that opportunity to work with Jericho at least for a couple of minutes in the main event of Raw just so he can say he did it. All in all, it was an okay show. C plus B. You know, there were some good in-ring matches, some good in-ring segments, and I was happy with most of what I saw on Raw, except for just a few of those ridiculous things I mentioned earlier. Before I get out of here, I do want to talk about the WWE releases. They released a whole bunch of names last week. There could be more to come. Uh, this is what we've come to expect. I mean, there's a lot of backlash. A lot of fans are pissed. Look, I'm not pissed at all. This is part of the game. This is what happens. 
regardless of whether or not we all feel whether the released party deserves it, it doesn't matter. That's the business they're in, and you can be released at any given day. But with that being said, that doesn't mean I'm not disappointed in some of the releases. I mean, they released Damian Sandow, a guy that fans cheer for, a guy that fans cheer for during other people's matches. He is one of the only guys in this era, you know, maybe Zack Ryder could be another one, that got himself over. I mean, WWE put him in ridiculous situation and after ridiculous situation, uh, and the guy embraced it. He went out there with whatever dumbass gimmick they were giving him or whatever silly-ass way they wanted him to dress him up one week. He went out there and made the best of it and got it fucking over. I thought for sure all of this humiliation was going to pay off one day for this guy, that the WWE says to themselves, see, he's willing to go out there and do anything. The fans like him. He's a good worker. He's a good talker. What the fuck is the problem? And that just goes to show you how much we don't know about what goes on behind the scenes in the WWE. I mean, the fans are screaming about what an outrage this is. Maybe WWE has their reasons. Maybe there's something going on behind the scenes that we don't know about. Probably not. Damian Sandow seems like a stand-up guy. Never heard anything bad about the guy. However, what the hell is their problem? Why can't the creative team come up with anything for him? Does he not like the writers? Do the writers not like him? Does Vince not like his face? As we've heard that about some other guys with Vince. I mean, what exactly was the story here? This was a perfectly capable and valuable talent that the WWE just completely tossed away and made zero effort to do anything with. So in that respect, even though I think the WWE are idiots for never doing anything with him, they did still do the right thing by releasing him. They have to. If they're not going to use him, why the fuck are you going to pay him? Damian Sandow is probably a guy at this point in his career that's better off because he's been with the WWE for a while. Fans like him. They'll come to see him. He can get a paycheck anywhere. He can work the independence. Hell, he can go to TNA. He can make Ring of Honor appearances. He can go to Japan. He can do plenty of stuff to earn a paycheck. I'm not worried about the guy financially. He will be fine. If anything, he's released. He's escaped the prison yard of the WWE that limits what he can do. They monitor you while you wipe your ass in that company. So now he is free to do whatever he wants and he can live his life and hopefully his career will will prosper from it. And maybe WWE can bring him back one day when he goes out there and shows how over he can get without the WWE's help. And we see that a lot. I mean, we got a guy right now in WWE. Look at uh, Luke Gallows. Wasn't he just flat out released by the WWE? I don't think he quit. I think they let him go. He went out there and got better and got himself over and was a big player in Japan and everything he was doing with the Bullet Club and WWE brought him back in. So a lot of these guys, when they leave, there is the potential, provided that they're not too old, for them to come back. And I think possibly Damian Sandow could be one of those guys. Wade Barrett is another one. Another perfectly good talent that the WWE completely wipes their ass with and does nothing with. And uh, he's out of there too. Good. He needed to leave. He's the same way. He can wrestle anywhere. He'll always have a paycheck. He will be fine. Maybe, just maybe, maybe, maybe one day we can see him back in the WWE. Alex Riley was another guy that was released. He's currently in NXT. That's a little bit of karma. I kind of just caught wind like two days ago of the Twitter feud that was going on between Riley and the Sala Monster. And Alex Riley really just comes off as a dick. And I think it's kind of funny that he got released like just a day or two after all this Twitter shit was going on. Zeb Coulter was one that I was sad about. I'm a huge Dirty Dutch Mantel fan. And on top of that, I think the guy could be useful in other ways in the WWE. Why didn't they keep him on as a consultant or something? I know you can't make this guy a full-time creative team member. He probably doesn't even want to do that. But the guy is one of the smartest wrestling minds in the history of the business. He's responsible for a lot of guys getting over and a lot of guys credit, you know, the success of their careers to him. And just having a guy like that back there for the creative team to talk to, maybe some writer that doesn't know shit about wrestling can just pick his brain a little bit. It's guys like this that I just wish there were more of in the WWE. And even though he was just an on-screen character and didn't have any creative input at all, he's a guy that I think could have worked backstage and that I wish did. But again, just like with everybody else, if they're not using him, why pay him? Dutch is fine. I'm sure he saved his money. He doesn't need the WWE, so... uh You know, it's sad that that partnership has finally come to an end. Other than that, we just had the two little guys. Hornswoggle, after all these years, has finally been released. I've been expecting that for a long time. Again, they ain't using him, so don't pay him. As long as he's on good terms with the WWE, he's the perfect type of guy that they can bring in for an appearance. You know how they bring in Boogeyman sometimes? They can do the same shit with Hornswoggle. El Torito... 
I don't know about him. I mean, they had to release him because the Matadors are no more. Hell, they're re-debuting next week under a completely different gimmick. So you have no use for El Torito. So he was on the chopping block, not surprisingly. And we had one diva or one women's wrestler, and that was Cameron, who was also released. So that is the first batch of names. There probably will be more to come. Wouldn't be surprised if Ryback is a future name on that list either because we all know about his contract negotiations and disputes with the WWE. He even released some sort of a letter that I read where he uh, you know, was letting the fans know of his issues and a lot of it has to do with the financial pay scale in the WWE and the pay quality is way out of balance You know, even though the guys on top have to go out there and work with somebody to put him over. He feels that the guys that go out there and lose all the time should be paid a fair amount as well, and uh, he's right. <laughs> you know, I can't argue with Ryback at all. So if he winds up leaving WWE, you know he's going to demand a relatively high price tag for the independent scene or wherever else he goes, and he should get paid. Santino, by the way, Santino Morella, that's the other one I forgot to mention. He was just kind of on... Uh, I don't know what's it called, an ambassador deal or a Legends deal type of thing since he's retired, doing some promotional work for WWE and making an occasional appearance. Uh, But again, they have no use to really keep this guy on as a regular talent and pay him regularly, so they released him. That's a relationship that I have no doubt ended on good terms. Santino's another guy that could probably show his face in the WWE again sometime in the future. So that about does it for me for this week. Thanks for listening. Again, I apologize for the delay on the Q&A, but I will get back to working on that this week, and I should have that to you in just a few days, so stay tuned. Other than that, I will catch you next week after Monday Night Raw. I believe that's the go-home Extreme Rules Raw, so I'll probably come up with a review of that and predictions, and we'll talk about all of that next week. It should be fun. So until next time... Peace.